Welcome to Cast of Wonders, the fiction audio magazine for young adults featuring stories of the fantastic. I'm Graham Dunlop. Today we present Fearing the Invasion by Eric Del Carlo. Eric, who lives in California, has been writing since his early 20s. He knew the late Robert Asperin well and collaborated with him on two novels. His work has appeared in Asimov's, Sybil's Garage, Necrotic Tissue and Everyday Fiction amongst many, many others. You can find several of his books on Amazon and you can find out more about Eric himself at ericdelcarlo.com. Check the show notes for details. Your narrator today is Marguerite Kenner, the crime fighting, rock climbing, symbol banging girl Friday extraordinaire. And now, we've a tale to tell. Fearing the Invasion by Eric Del Carlo. You didn't want motor things. Nothing that used fuel or even solar. Nothing with any kind of engine, really. Except when that engine was you. That was okay. You weren't going to break down unexpectedly. Well, you probably weren't. All you had to be was smart. Know your limits. Know how far you could go. And when it was time to turn back. That was how Fiddy explained it to Brock as they got the boat ready. Boats or motorcycles, she said. Putting her back into it as together, they shoved the canoe out of the yellow reeds. Sweat was already streaming down her back. Or your own two feet. That's the way to travel. How far you figure? Brock asked, with just a hint of hesitation. His tiny muscles stood out on bony arms as, waiting now, they got the craft free of the reedy shore. Fiddy heard that little misgiving. Well, we could just go over there, she pointed at the hump of a reef not half a click away, and come right on back. How about that? She said it with fake sweetness. Brock's face tightened. Get for real, huh? She smiled, not faking it this time. In a serious tone, she said, How about all the way to the city? I'm not eager to stay here and listen to them, are you? Nope. He liked her. She knew it. They had done a kiss once, but nothing else. She knew he'd also kissed Marley, Suela, Clava, and who knew who else. That was okay. Fiddy didn't need a lovesick puppy hanging around her neck. Plus, he would be good for this. Brock didn't just want to impress the girls. He liked to accomplish things. Even the grown-up said so. He held the canoe's side while she slipped lithely aboard with her waterproof sack of supplies. Then she steadied the vessel as well as she could and he climbed, dripping, into the back end. The water was warm, the daylight bright, the day itself humid. Brock's sleeveless top clung, showing his scrawny chest. His thin legs poked out of his short pants, toes wiggling in sandals. Fiddy was dressed the same, some of the clothing weaved, some of itself. You could find useful stuff if you went and looked for it, or even just picked it up when it washed in. Some of the groans, though, would only wear clothing made by the locals' weavers. They were mostly the same ones who wouldn't shut up for a minute about the invasion, which was partially why Fiddy wanted to get away today. You couldn't listen to talk like that forever. She and Brock took up the paddles, which were made of pressed metaplastic that wasn't ever going to decay, and started away. The narrow canoe creaked, tipped a little too far one way, then settled. Working together, they glided outward from the land. This was the West Fringe, not even really a part of the local. But nobody lived here, so it didn't matter what it was called. It just was. So Fiddy had figured. Where Brock liked finishing the physical tasks he started, she liked thinking things through to their ends. In a few minutes, they were sliding past that reef she'd pointed to before. It was an ancient, capsized ship, with just a bit of the keel poking out of the water, coated with coral. 
She thought of making some comment to Brock about the reef, like, did he want to go back now? But teasing was teasing, and mean was mean. And Brock didn't just like her, she liked him too, else she wouldn't have kissed him that time. So instead of anything sarcastic, she asked over her knobby shoulder, Doing okay back there? She heard his paddle cutting the water steadily, with a little more strength than necessary even. Doing as good as you, he said. Fiddy grinned and dug in with her own paddle. This wasn't a contest. Two people couldn't compete when they were in the same canoe. They aimed off down the half-submerged shoreline, vaguely southwest. Sunlight bounced bright off the water. This wasn't a watercraft that could go far or haul back much, but that was okay. They would go and look for salve at the edges of the sunken city. No one was expecting them back because they hadn't told anyone where they were going. Fiddy was glad it was just her and Brock. She didn't care too much if they found anything to bring back. She had, honestly, mostly wanted to get away from all that talk about the invasion. It had been getting intense lately. The oldest grown-ups huddled around the ancient equipment all day, listening, studying the readings that never made much sense. They mumbled woefully and shook their heads. But Fiddy, thinking it through, had decided that they enjoyed it. All the gloom, all the dire talk about an invasion from the skies, and the end of all things on Earth. Well, that wasn't her idea of fun. So, with sweat making her cropped short blonde hair stand stiff, and her arms and ribs starting to ache from the paddling, she bent determinedly to the journey ahead. Behind her, she heard Brock grunting, his paddle splashing, and it felt good to have him here. This all felt good. With every forward stroke, the whole notion of the invasion receded more and more. She had been named after a singer from long, long ago. Fiddy had heard a little of that music. Recordings played for her on some of that ancient equipment. Music so loud and fast you could barely catch any of the words. She was unsure what to make of it. Most of the music she'd heard in her life came from wind instruments that people carved or surfaces they banged on for rhythmic effects. And when people sang, and there were good singers around the local, it was sweet and fluttery, all about love and magic and rebirth. You didn't hear a lot of sad songs, nor ones about violence or anything else unpleasant. Her mother sang, but just when she was working the vegetable patches, to pass the time, she said. Brock's family were all builders and repairers. Get a bunch of his brothers and uncles and aunts together at sunrise, and they'd put up a home you could live in by the next day. Brock, Fiddy suspected, was a little self-conscious about being so skinny, but he'd probably start to fill out soon. Just like, Fiddy thought with her own flush of misplaced embarrassment, she was probably going to fill out too, one of these days. They were a good ways down the shoreline now. They had truly left the local behind. The area they called home was large, but it wasn't a greedy amount of land. Its natural borders were made up of a range of brambly hills to the north, an eastward river, the crumbling concrete snake of an ancient road which had long since been stripped of vehicles, and this body of water, the edge of which Fiddy and Brock were steadily navigating. It became thirsty work, and they paused for water from the container in Fiddy's sack. She also had fruit, and offered Brock a nectarine all to himself. He proposed they split it. She bit off half and handed over the other. Brock took it, hiding a smile that was either shy or sly. She knew what it meant. The fruit's half had touched her mouth. Him eating it was like kissing her again, kinda. After, they paddled more. The strain had left Fiddy's shoulders. This felt good, like physical exertions always did after a while, even though she knew she'd be sore tomorrow. Probably she would be hurting later on today, which was why they couldn't stay too long at the sunken city. Going all that way was maybe not the wisest idea, but she knew she could push herself on the way back, no matter how tired she was. Same went for Brock, if not more so. They weren't machines. They didn't break down or stop working when just one little part went bad. 
That was what happened to the Earth long ago. There had been too many things with the potential to go wrong, and when it did get bad, it just kept getting worse until everything finally broke down completely. At least, that's how she evaluated history. The reeds along the shore changed from yellow to a greenish yellow. They paddled on, and on some more, pausing to palm sweat out of her eyes. Fiddy blinked and saw the first signs of the towers ahead. She turned around, grinning. I see him, Brock said, like it had been some kind of competition to see who would spot the sunken city's spires first. She took up her paddle again, stroking harder now, eager to get there. The city always excited her, even though she'd been to it many times. It was only in the last year or so, though, that she had made the trips without any groans. This was the first time she'd brought Brock along. Let's ground the canoe there, he said, pointing over her shoulder at the leaning upper stories of the closest building. It was white with bird droppings, and the water slapped gently at it. How about we go a little farther? Okay. After all, this wasn't just a salve run. Fiddy really was disturbed by what some of the groans were saying. The oldest one seemed convinced by the signals from the detecting equipment, even though others said nobody truly knew how to decipher them. Maybe the invasion was nothing more than ancient satellites still orbiting the Earth, a concept that still made Fiddy's head whirl. Things with motors causing trouble. Fiddy shook her head as they passed that first building, moving out over the city proper. With the day bright like it was and the water clear, you could almost see the bottom. She looked over the side onto rooftops far below. Here and there the towers rose, the ones that poked their tops up out of the water. Of course, it wasn't a neat orderly place. It was a ruin, with a lot of the structures torn away, and even some of the mighty towers lying on their sides. But you could see, almost, what it must have been like. A big place. But more than that, it was tightly packed together. Buildings jammed against each other. Streets were laid out like a grid. So different from the casual layout of the local, where there was so much space, just an easy sprawl where a few hundred people lived and grew food and fished, and made music and loved each other as best they could and had babies and survived. But down there, everyone was gone, long gone. The water had won, and it had ripped this whole city apart, just like it had done all over the world so long ago. Fiddy shook herself. She was still staring down. She slapped the paddle deliberately at the view and pulled hard. They had passed a couple more of the towers. Another was looming ahead, the old crumbling tip of a structure that must have once soared high into the sky. How about there, she said. Okay. Brock must have seen this as her expedition with himself along. For what? Maybe he wanted to be alone with her. Or maybe he too was unnerved by the talk about the invasion. They cut smoothly towards the tower, whose two uppermost levels stood exposed. The glass was gone from all of the windows, and the roof itself had caved in. But those two stories were more or less intact and safe to walk on. Fiddy had come here before, with her mother and a crew who were diving deep for salve. She must have been young then, since she remembered her mother bouncing her in her arms and they walked along the edges. She hopped out first, Brock followed, and they pulled the canoe up. It was fairly light, hammered into its sleek, useful shape by one of the local's boat builders. The tower's stubborn, corroding beams provided shadow, and Fiddy and Brock stood in the coolness a moment. You hungry? she asked him. Nah. You want to dive first? Go ahead. He went, leaving his sandals. Fiddy stood dutifully at the spot where he dropped into the water, watching the bubbles as he descended, ready to dive herself if there was trouble. Brock moved swiftly, going down the tower's face. The structure's shadow interfered with her line of sight on him a little. When it was her turn, she would make her dive off the sunken building's opposite side. A minute later, he was back up, not trying to impress her with how long he could stay down. Doing that would be childish and dangerous, and they both knew better having learned safety from their families.
Brock slapped a bundle of fabric onto the cracked concrete floor and slipped easily up over the side. He gave himself an energetic shake, flinging droplets, and Fiddy helped him unfurl his prize. It was a vaguely square piece of some durable cloth, maybe a meter cross, ragged around the edges, but definitely usable. Good job, she said. Thanks. He was grinning, still drawing deep breaths. The dive had obviously exhilarated him. He followed Fiddy as she led him to the other side of the tower, stepping over chunks of debris. Though the roof was gone, the level above this one remained mostly intact, still supported by the massive beams which ran right down through the whole structure. Fiddy stepped out of her own sandals, drew long, slow breaths, clearing her mind and letting strength flow into her body. Diving for salve wasn't a game, and she'd never treated it like one. It's why the groans let her do this. Same for Brock. The water was just a half meter below the brim, and her dive was clean. She kicked her legs above her, trim form cutting down. The light was good here. Spread below, the drowned ancient city revealed itself more clearly. What a strange and troubling wonder it was. But Fiddy didn't let herself get distracted. Time was limited and she concentrated. She reached the nets. These were strung all over the city's towers, and salvers from the local came out here to check them regularly. The strong netting was laid across the building's glassless windows, catching the stray dregs that flowed through. Naturally, the currents had over the centuries stripped the city, taking away anything loose, but a lot of debris drifted through the oceans, and some of it washed through here, and some of that ended up caught by these nets. Fiddy held her breath tightly in her lungs as she used the net strands to propel her across its face, moving hand over hand. Visibility was good. She was aware of the movements of fish around her, but saw nothing big or dangerous. She was aware, too, of the stresses on her body. In about another 15 seconds, she would start back up. But she had spotted her prize. It looked like cable of some kind, maybe a little bigger than what she could easily handle. But if it wasn't tangled in the net, she would grab it. Working fast, she got to it and laid her hands on it. At first, she thought it was stuck, but with a tug, it came free. It was about as thick around as her thumb and flexible, and unwinding revealed itself to be twice as long as she was. She threw a loop over her shoulder, then kicked off, aiming back towards the surface. The cable dragged. It was heavier than she figured, but still not unmanageable. She pressed her lips tight, lungs starting to ache a little. Above, the water brightened. She hadn't let herself get turned around. Her legs kicked. She was almost there. Suddenly, she was yanked. She knew before she looked that the trailing end of the cable had caught on the barnacled face of the submerged building. She could let it go, but then the treasure would be lost. This cable was valuable. Builders, like those who made up Brock's family, would find it useful or else the folks who kept the locals' few machines running could use it. Though it certainly wasn't worth risking her life over, Fiddy was reluctant to give up on it just now. All this flashed through her mind in a single, speedy heartbeat. She was already swiveling around, reaching back. She could get the cable uncaught. Besides, if she got into real trouble, Brock was up there watching out. In fact, another few seconds and he would probably come diving in himself. But he didn't need to. Fiddy pulled the cable's loose end from the jagged spur of metal where it had snagged, and she shot upwards again, urgently now, lungs burning, needing air. Her head was just beginning to feel dizzy. She broke the water's surface with a huge gasp, putting out a hand to hang there a moment from the concrete lip, just breathing. Amazing how sweet air could taste. Almost immediately, her head cleared but she had pushed it, nearly to the danger point. If a groan had seen what she'd done, she would get a talking to. No adults were here, though. But where was Brock? Fiddy blinked and looked around. He should be reaching down to take the cable off her shoulders, maybe help her up. Where? The invasion! The terrible thought shot through her. While she had been underwater, the invaders had come, and they had taken off Brock! It was awful, so awful, and so ridiculous. Fiddy gave herself a little mental kick. 
Summoning her strength, she heaved the cable up onto the ground. It was even heavier without the water to buoy it. She climbed up after it, still drawing deep, refreshing breaths. She looked around, saw her sandals, Brock's too, as well as the fabric he'd salved and her sack of supplies. At the far end of the tower, the canoe was still there. Where had Brock gone, then? Part 1 of Fearing the Invasion ends here. Where did Brock skive off to? Why wasn't he around supporting Fiddy? Find out next week. In the meantime, drop by our forum and tell us what you thought of the story at castofwonders.org slash forums. We love bringing you this free podcast. However, the stories do not come free. We pay the authors for them. If you'd like to support Cast of Wonders, visit our webpage. You'll see two donate buttons there. One for one-time donations and one for monthly donations. We'd greatly appreciate you hitting one of those buttons. Cast of Wonders is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Share it, but don't change or sell it. Theme is Appeal to Heavens by Alexei Nov from musicalley.com. <laughs>